today we have Jason Roussel joining us for a special presentation on intuitive eating for a heart healthy holiday season. Jason is a registered dietitian at Community Health Resource Center and has a master's degree in nutritional science from San Jose State University. In addition to his work at CHRC, Jason leads mindful eating and stress management groups and is an instructor at San Francisco State University in the holistic health department. Jason integrates a healthy at every size approach, utilizing his certification in intuitive eating and mindful eating to help his clients create healthier relationships with food, their bodies, and their health. <clears throat> his experience includes disease prevention, cardiovascular health, cancer, blood sugar control, gastrointestinal health, emotional eating, and sports nutrition. And with that, I'll pass it along to Jason to get into his presentation. Thank you, Lily, and welcome everyone. And thank you to the Canbar Cardiac Care Center for hosting uh, this talk today. I'm, I'm uh, very excited to, to speak with you all about heart health and the holidays. Uh, and I want to share my screen. Okay, there that is. Uh, good. Um, so um, as Lily mentioned, before I jump into what, what we're gonna talk about today, uh, your questions, I, I would love to hear from you. I'd like to answer questions. I want to include uh, that in the talk. However, I will wait till the end really to engage with that so that we can get all the information to you. Uh, and then, um, but you're welcome to submit your questions throughout and then I will address them toward the end. Okay, so I'm gonna use two well-studied dietary approaches to help us explore the connection between nutrition and your heart health. I'm going to talk, I'm gonna go inside the body with you, talk a little bit about physiology. We can understand some of the, the ways that, that food influences metabolism, including the impact that, that our diets have on our arteries and inflammation. I'm also gonna focus on practical approaches, some specific diets, as I mentioned, what to eat, what to eat more of, what to eat less of, um, but also some techniques to help you uh, not only understand what's healthy for you, but also how to navigate the holiday season, which one of my patients recently told me is eating season. Um, I'm sure all of us are familiar with how that works. And as Lily mentioned, I am my my approach to nutrition is really rooted in in mindfulness. So I'm going to be using some mindfulness techniques with you today. In in particular, this uh, program is called intuitive eating to help us um, have a healthier relationship with with not only food but but also our bodies, our minds, and and how we think about nutrition and health. Okay, so let's start inside the body. Nutrition, really lifestyle in a broader sense, can have a huge impact on protecting our heart health. And a lot of this has to do with the lining of our arteries. So I've given you a bit of a, a cross section here, understanding that arteries are not just tubes. These are living tissues and the endothelial lining, that's the, the inner part of the, of the artery is really essential to maintaining heart health. So we're gonna talk about factors and foods and approaches that really help to keep that lining healthy and ones that mm, have the opposite effect. Some of this can be about inflammation, can cause uh, some of the damage that um, we see in arterial health. So first, some factors that we want to control. These are circulating compounds in the blood in many ways that can have damage to, uh, to the arteries. And our ideal diet would minimize some of these factors. So decreasing excessive circulating fats and sugars, while also in controlling blood pressure. Our ideal diet would also maximize factors that enhance the benefits to that endothelial health that I've been talking about. 
And these um, protective factors in the blood are things like circulating high density lipoprotein. So this is a type of cholesterol in the blood that is protective, but also antioxidant compounds and anti-inflammatory compounds that we find in primarily in plant foods. And all of these help us to have more pliant, more flexible arteries that can then be responsive to changes in blood pressure. So we can understand what the healthy environment in the blood might look like, but how do we create this healthy environment? So let's start with a uh, recommendations from the American Heart Association. And this was from 2010, which with a committee of experts looking at all the research on lifestyle and heart health, identifying seven of the most important factors. Some of these are behaviors like how we move, how we eat, how we mm, don't smoke, I guess. Um, and some of them are um, health outcomes like blood pressure and our cholesterol. These are the circulating fats I've been talking about, blood sugar uh, and body weight. So I'm focused, I work with people on lifestyle health. So exercise is part of that. Sleep and stress, I would also add to this list, but then it becomes ever expanding. Um, but today, of course, I'm gonna be focusing on the eat right part. And our first diet that I'm gonna talk about is called the DASH diet. And this is, the most studied has the most research supporting it as an approach to improve heart health. Some of you may not be familiar with this diet. You may be more familiar with our second diet that we're going to talk about, which is the Mediterranean diet. And I'm going to explain the uh, similarities and differences between the two. The DASH diet has been clinically proven to prevent heart disease and follows generally agreed upon dietary principles. So it's not something that, that is gonna be foreign to, to you when you hear what you should be eating and not eating on the diet. It also has lots of online supportive materials that are freely available. This is primarily through the National Institute of Health. And at the end of the talk, I'll have a slide that shows resources for you. And we will share these slides with you in our follow-up um, email as well. But as you can see on this slide, <laughs> The DASH diet might need a little PR work. Um, the Journal of the American Medical Association recently had an editorial pointing out this fact that um, many people just aren't, aren't inspired by DASH, and they recommended a few uh, phrases that we could use to make it more interesting. So I don't know if I, any of those uh, spark your interest, but uh, hopefully. Um, and one of the ways to, to, to understand what some of the trends in, in nutrition is really about marketing. So the DASH diet doesn't say what it is or what it's doing. I mean, the name itself, I didn't explain that yet. It's an acronym, Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. So you could also summarize that, you know, their recommendations, it's really you know, follow the guidelines, <laughs> eat your vegetables, don't eat too much. You know, these are, these are standard nutrition advice that's been around for a long time. So maybe not as exciting as some of the more modern ones, like the eat like a caveman or low carb solution. Those can be a bit more catchy. So what do you eat on this diet? The, the focus on high blood pressure in the DASH diet might make you think about sodium. Many people understand high salt diets can cause or make high blood pressure worse. Reducing your sodium intake can lower your blood pressure, but that's only one part of it. The diet, this, the, the diet provides, it's, it's a whole foods-based diet with lots of plant foods. And one thing this does is it provides the symphony of nutrients. They all work together in the different kinds of plant foods that you eat to promote uh, better blood pressure and healthier endothelium, those real pliant arteries that we want. So on this diet, you're eating more plant foods, you're eating lean meats, you're limiting processed foods, uh, you're limiting high fat animal meats and dairy products. So this will all sound familiar to you, of course. I don't think any of that's revolutionary. 
And it's also similar to the Mediterranean diet. Those, um, the Mediterranean diet is, is an approach that is very similar in terms of what you should and shouldn't be eating. There are a couple key differences though. They don't, they're not quite as focused on, on sodium intake in the Mediterranean diet. And there's a bit more fat in that one. So you think you can see that their recommendations for DASH is about 30% of your daily calories coming from fat, whereas Mediterranean is 40%. Um, and, and the way they come up with these percentages, you know, there, there are three macronutrients that provide calories in the diet, protein, fat, and carbohydrates. So your percentage of those three compounds is what we're talking about when we say something like eating 30% of your diet from fat. Now, I want to talk about fat because just putting one number on it doesn't tell the whole story. So I'm going to get back to that in a little bit. There is, I'm sneaking in a third approach, I suppose, um, in terms of, of diets, which is the healthy plate. And this one, as you can see, is from Harvard's medical school. And here you get a little bit more detail than what I've shared in, in some of these, the other two diets in the sense of we're, we're, we're all three emphasizing the quality of the foods you eat. Here you can also see that color really matters. There's a reason why there's such a colorful slide on here. Um, we, you know, for, for kids that I talk to in, in say an elementary school or at the local um, garden education program, we talk about eating the rainbow and the different colors are stand-ins for different nutrients. So that's par partially why the variety of the colors on your plate really matters. I like this um, diagram too, because you can see here that at least three quarters of your food should be coming from plants. That's the whole grains, the vegetables, the fruits, and of course the healthy protein part that could come from plants too, but that is where the animal products would fit in. Okay, so I also want to share with you some of the um, research and the ways that the, the numbers can change when we follow some of these diet. So for example, the DASH diet can lower your blood pressure by seven to 12 points. It also has, in, you know, this, this research that I was talking about, it lowers the risk for not just heart disease, but also uh, all the diseases related to metabolic function or the physiology of the body, things like diabetes, cancer, but also diseases of the bone. So it helps to create strong bones and healthy skin and um, brain function. So things like Alzheimer's and dementia risk can go down following this diet. One key factor in nutrition, in my opinion, is that you don't have to be perfect. The closer you get to following the recommendations, the bigger the impact will be on your health, but moving the needle even a little bit will get you some of these benefits. So back to the arteries. Now, you can understand that the, the, the direct impact that food has on increasing the, the flexibility of your arteries so that they are less stiff, meaning less resistance to blood flow. And that way the heart doesn't have to work so hard. We're gonna focus on a couple of compounds in food that have the biggest impact on heart health. Uh, but I also wanna mention this part too, which is that we know that, 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 that sodium has an effect on blood pressure. And sometimes we talk about it in terms of fluid uh, volume, but it also has this, this effect on the stiffness of the arteries. High potassium and magnesium foods counteract that. Where do we get potassium and magnesium from? Colorful plants. So it might be uh, sweet potatoes or tomatoes or bananas or oranges, but it also might come from whole grains and beans. So the compound, the other compounds in food that can have a negative impact on arterial health are sugar, fat, and salt. So now I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about those three things. 
And first we're gonna start with sugar. And the problem here is with excess sugar. And this is really added sugars to differentiate from the sugar that you would get in say fruit, for example. And when we, the problem with eating lots of sugar at one time is that it causes high levels of sugar in the blood. This is blood glucose. And when we have lots of sugar circulating in the blood, this damages uh, blood vessels and organs can also raise blood pressure. This increases the chance of breakdown uh, and disease of really all organ systems in the body, which is part of why we see the benefit to these diets on diseases of different organ systems. These fast absorbing sugars also can increase our circulating triglycerides. This is another fat in the blood that can be pro-inflammatory and cause uh, problems with arterial health. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about, about those different circulating fats as well. Excess sugar is pro-inflammatory because in part that it does cause damage, but it also increases our insulin level, insulin being the hormone that takes the sugar out of the blood into the cells. Insulin is a growth hormone. This can ramp up inflammation through our immune system. So uh, another reason why we wanna make sure that we have as balanced control of our blood sugars as we can. So here's some research on the impact of excess added sugar in the diet. And you can see just one soda every day increases the risk of dying from heart disease by almost a third. And the people who consume the most sugar in their diet were nearly twice as likely to die from heart disease as those who limited their intake to 10 teaspoons a day. One 12 ounce soda, just for your reference, has about nine teaspoons per day. So it's not going to zero. It's not highly restrictive to see quite a big impact. And part of that is because most Americans consume way more than that. Um, you can do this for your in your own mind to yourself. Just take a guess uh, for one of our seasonal uh, approaches here. Um, what is a, uh, this is a grande latte in, from uh, the Starbucks, not to pick on them, but the pumpkin spice latte question. Um, our modern food system, of course, is loaded with not just added sugars, but also lots of high sodium foods and very rich foods high in fat. And our answer is 12 teaspoons, um, more than that uh, 12 ounce soda that we were talking about. For another reference point, the World Health Organization recommends less than 10% of your total energy intake come from added sugars. And this can really have an impact on health. The, the average US intake is three times this number. And the, some of the research showed that reducing this below 5% of your daily intake per day can even have further health benefits. Oh, there, I put the numbers on the slide for you as well. Okay, so let's shift to fats. We talked about sugars. We're gonna talk about fats now. So we, we saw how sugars can have an influence on this, driving up blood pressure and triglycerides. Circulating fats like triglycerides, but also LDL, this is the low density lipoproteins. These can increase plaque buildup, which I haven't talked too much about yet, but that's just another factor that can contribute to stiffness and of course, potentially cause the chance for blocked arteries leading to heart attack and stroke. So to improve your LDL cholesterol, you really wanna watch your saturated fat intake and I'll explain what foods have that, but also increase your fiber. So just like I was talking about with blood pressure, there are compounds in foods that you want to limit like sodium, and for cholesterol, saturated fat, but there are also foods that are protective and beneficial and you wanna eat more of, like high potassium and magnesium foods for blood pressure and high fiber foods for cholesterol. So this is where we get the eat more and eat less ideas. 
Um, so for protective um, benefits to your cholesterol, we want to eat more fiber. Like I mentioned, fiber comes from plants. So this is why you see 75% of your plate coming from plant foods. And both the DASH and the Mediterranean diets, of course, include all of these foods. Reducing high, uh, high fiber diets can have an impact on LDL cholesterol, improving numbers by up to five to 10%. Some of this has to do with the benefit of fats, also has to do with inflammation. You see the, the omega-3 fatty acids on here. This is the picture of the salmon. That's a, that's a good source of omega-3s, and those are anti-inflammatory compounds. So for, again, we're talking about cholesterol. For reducing cholesterol, eating less saturated fat. Saturated fat comes primarily from high-fat animal foods like red meats and uh, dairy. So you can see the recommendation here. Four ounces is about the size of your palm much less than most people eat <laughs> uh, when they have something like a steak, say. And uh, I'll talk about how to, how to eat less meat in your diet in a moment. Many people struggle with that. But saturated fat also can come from plants. The tropical oils like coconut and palm oil are also saturated. You can tell what a saturated fat is if you have a jar of it, if it's at room temperature is solid, that's a saturated fat. So butter, coconut oil also looks like lard, basically, when you when you have some. So those um, those saturated fats are the ones we want to limit. I also mentioned processed meats here. They have a particular connection with um, lots of sodium often, but also potentially cancer risk. And you can see some of these numbers improving uh, cholesterol on the bottom of the screen. Okay, so some of the more practical advice. Uh, one way to think about this is using meat more as a condiment and less as a main food on the plate. Helping you to reduce your portions, keeping in mind that recommendation for the four ounces. And instead, when you, whenever you talk about decreasing or taking something out of the diet, it's very important to, to think about well, what am I going to replace that with? What am I eating? Not what am I not eating? So of course, I'm recommending that you replace some of your meat with high fiber foods like vegetables and beans. Some examples for you about uh, how to do this are on the screen. I like uh, a couple of these. One, something like, think about like if you make chili, you can have a pot of chili that's full of ground beef, or you can have a pot of chili that has a little bit of ground beef or even ground turkey and lots of vegetables and beans. Same sauce, same flavorings, same taste, really. Slightly different texture, sure, but not dramatically different and totally different impact on your heart health. Another one that's nice is, is Things, th are things like meatballs or beef patties or hamburgers, replacing some of that meat with, again, chopped finely diced or even ground up mushrooms, vegetables, beans, or even nuts. Okay, so I want to spend a little bit of time now talking about intuitive eating and the holidays. So I'd like to take a moment here to do an exercise with you. And this is something that I do with my patients and especially with the groups that I lead on both um, mindful eating and intuitive eating. So right now, to take a moment to tune into your own body signals. Think about how hungry are you? And you can rate this on a scale from one to 10, 10 being starving. I, mean, I can't think of anything but food and one being of no interest in food at all. So for each of you can come up with a number in your own mind. And now that you've done that, think about what helped you come up with that number. How did you decide on what your hunger reading is? You might've considered 
something like, oh, I can, I haven't eaten in a couple of hours, or I just had lunch, or uh, maybe you're getting signals from the body. You feel a rumble in your stomach, or you feel an emptiness, or um, you feel a, full, a sense of fullness. So that's really what I'm looking for here is this, the, this uh, tuning into internal signals of our body from our bodies about how we desire food. You can do the same thing with fullness. And there's a couple key differences. And you see these, these two scales overlap a bit. Um, that's because, you know, if we're not that full, then we're a little bit hungry. If we're very full, then we're likely not hungry. So they kind of, they don't, it's not one-to-one, -one, but they, they definitely go, they're not separate. They definitely go together. Um, just to understand a little bit too, that these are both, both physiologic as well as um, can be emotional. Um, stress can have an impact on people's hunger and fullness levels, how much you've slept, fatigue, uh, but also, you know, other senses. Like if you have uh, seen a commercial about food, people will rate their hunger levels to be a little bit higher. Some of the internal signals you might experience around hunger have to do with blood sugars. So I was talking about how to keep your blood sugars from being too high. But additionally, if our blood sugars drop too low, then that's a sign of hunger to the, to the, to the mind. So lower blood sugars tend to create a sense of hunger. Fullness has a little bit more to do with stretch receptors in the stomach. And this is why you may have noticed that you can eat a meal kind of past a level of comfort before you quite realize it. So you may finish a large meal. Thanksgiving might have been an example in your own life where that happened, uh, where yeah, at the end you're like, oh my gosh, what did I do? I ate too much. I feel terrible. I can barely move. Our signals are, are these stretch receptors in the stomach have a delay. So we really don't notice them until about you know, 20 minutes or so after we finish a meal. So all of this, excuse me, um, is about uh, helping us understand a little bit with a little more intuition what it is that works well for our own bodies and help to help guide us in terms of not only what we're eating, but how much we're eating as well. So I put this on here about how you're really tapping into this natural ability to understand what your body needs. These uh, the, 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 the founders of intuitive eating, Evelyn Tribble and Elsie Raich, uh, put together these 10 principles. Uh, and you know this, this could be a whole series of talks just to dive into all this. It's a very any of the, the physiologic and psychological uh, aspects of eating, but they, they, the, the first principle here is really a shift in mindset. So the goal becomes about how can I take care of my body? How can I respect my internal signals around food and my own nourishment instead of, you know, what can I restrict or what can I limit or even, you know, how can I lose weight at any cost? So all of this helps us focus on foods that work best for you. It's a very individualized approach. So it's not, you know, I'm not telling someone you have to follow the Mediterranean diet. The Mediterranean diet, the DASH diet, these provide some of the examples, um, guidelines, you know, how it would, what it would look like to be, to have a healthy diet. And then you get to use those plus that's your external wisdom. We call that understanding of what nutrition is and how it impacts your health with your internal wisdom, which are the signals that you, um, your body gives you, uh, for not only your physical health, but also your mental health as well. All of this can help us to eat when we're hungry, stop when we're full, and choose portions and foods that we find satisfying in the moment, but also satisfying an hour later or the next day so that we know that 
we're eating foods that are healthy for us and feel good. So how does all this relate to the holidays? Um, I'm sure many of you can guess <laughs> uh, since we um, are kind of inundated with food right now, it can be a really good idea to have some techniques to that you can uh, use to help guide yourself, to help cope with some of the more challenging situations. So I got a couple of, um, we have a, uh, a list of questions that we received from you before the talk started, and we're going to try to address some of those today um, as well. And these were two of them. So I wanna talk about the first one, which is uh, stress, stress slash emotional eating. And this, you know, many of our cravings for food are triggered by, if you, if you crave sweets, they're gonna be triggered by having those foods around you. Many people also crave salty things. So if there are a bowl of chips out and you really like chips, then chances are you're gonna eat more of those chips. So. I'm going to talk about this concept of tuning into taste to help us understand one way to do that. So the intuitive eating principle, one of them is to, is to not restrict ourselves overly. Restriction, say, or, say for sweets, if you say, I'm not eating any sweets during the holidays. For most people, that'll work for a little while. And then they get in a situation where they might be really tired or they might be upset, emotional, they might be highly stressed. And our ability to uh, restrict ourselves from something that, that we really like just, just rapidly decreases in those situations. So then we tend to eat it. And if we've been trying to avoid it and we start eating it, many people will get a sense of failure and this giving up on the approach saying, oh, it's too hard, I can't do it. I'm just gonna let myself eat. And then I eat too much. So we get almost like a, a restriction and then an overeating can follow that. So this, this uh, concept of tuning into taste is a mindful eating approach where you really focus on eating the food. And I'll do a mindful eating exercise with, with participants in my groups where we might use a raisin, for example, and eating one raisin at a time and taking your time, closing your eyes, really feeling, noticing the taste, describing the taste and the texture in your mouth, as well as what it feels like physically as it moves through your, from your mouth into your throat, into your stomach, potentially. Um, and then contrasting that experience with how people normally eat raisins, uh, which is not one at a time usually. <laughs> so, um, some people even come into these exercises being like, Ugh, I don't really like raisins. And then they do it this way. And they're like, well, actually raisins are kind of good if I eat them like that. So this tuning into taste is just, a, it's just, it's just about mindfulness. It's about awareness. It's about paying attention to all of the sensations, our senses, uh, when we eat. You could do this with a full meal where you just sit down and look at the plate in front of you. Take a moment to describe what you see. Think about where the food came from. Take a bite of your food and really notice that like, hmm, what's, what am I tasting? What's the experience? How am I responding to this food? You also can do that halfway through the plate, checking in with yourself again. Do I want to keep eating? Am I enjoying this? And then all of these concepts, keep an open mind. You're really just being curious and non-judgmental. So the answer might be, yeah, this is good. I'm going to keep eating. Or it might be, it's not great, but I'm going to keep eating. <laughs> or maybe you don't want to finish it. And that's okay too, right? You can stop eating. So this is, um, this is a way to really pay attention to the physical response to food, moving away from what might be happening in our minds, stress or emotions, anger um, or excitement into the body. That's mindfulness, right? 
training our attention to be in the moment, the actual experience of what's happening, not what's going through my head. The second question is about a kind way to turn down a special dish or family traditional food. So I guess you might check in with yourself. You know, why is it that you're turning down this special dish or family food? Maybe it's okay to have it. Maybe you can have a bite. Um, but if it's really not, it's not something you like, or um, maybe you're vegan and <laughs> grandma's special dish is not vegan, um, then that, you know, that's a good question. And it's one that I recommend people think about beforehand. Most of us know what to expect going into situations around food with family. There's a lot of repetition and habit that goes into uh, the experiences that we have uh, around the holidays and foods, especially with family. So you can try some things out with yourself and think about, you know, what am I going to say? How am I going to respond to to these offers? And some, you know, you have to figure out what the best approach is for you. Some people find saying things like, you know, my doctor recommended a special diet for me and this, I, I, I can't eat this right now. I really appreciate you bringing this and it's a beautiful dish and I'm so happy to see you. Really what I care about is being with you in this, in this, um, at this holiday. So shifting the focus, you know, why are we gathering? It's not to eat. It's to be with people. The eating is part of it, and that's part of the enjoyment, but it's not the only thing. So if you're choosing to eat in a way that's slightly different from other people, then that can be a good a good a good way to 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 do that, which is to to shift that focus to, you know, I'm here to 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 be with you. the The second uh, recommendation around um, managing or creating more balance during, the holidays is really about focusing on nourishment. And this can be a big topic. So many people don't really think about this throughout the day. They think, you know, nutrition, I need to try to eat healthier or control my, my diet. So I skip breakfast, I have coffee, I have a salad for lunch. And then in the afternoon, I get hungry, but I kind of work through it and I can ignore it. And then it's dinner time at nighttime. And oh my gosh, I'm so hungry and I can't, um, sorry. And uh, then I can't control myself. And it's really like hunger takes over. This is, this is what we call primal hunger. And it's something that can hijack the brain. So this is another reason to focus on the uh, hunger and fullness scales. So one of the things we're trying to do is stay out of what we call the danger zone in terms of hunger. And that's maybe seven, eight, or nine, something like that. When I get really hungry, then things are, really, are a bit harder for me to make um, intentional choices around food. So I, and the way to do that in that scenario I was just talking about, you know, maybe you do or don't eat breakfast, but making sure to have more food earlier in the day. Maybe lunch is a little bit bigger. Maybe this person has a snack in the afternoon. So then when they get home, they're not quite so starving and overeating. So this is the focus on nourishment in terms of food. But nourishment can be about more than just food too. It can also be about getting enough rest, moving my body, connecting with friends. Social connections are a form of nourishment as well. So um, simply asking yourself, what does it mean to be well nourished and how can I do that is one way that you can also consider finding some balance in, in the holidays. Okay. So before I get to, um, some more questions, I want to point out a couple of, excuse me, resources for you. And I mentioned the National Institute of Health. That's the one with the the DASH guidelines. So they have, you know, uh, very clear like charts and graphs and what to eat and what to eat more of and what to eat less of, uh, but also lots of uh, guidelines around, you know, meals, suggestions and, and recipes, um, shopping lists, things like that. Uh, some of them are Mediterranean inspired, but there's also plenty that are of Latin American and uh, Asian flavors as well. So 
there's nothing so special just about Mediterranean diets. That's just one example of traditional approaches to eating that is healthy. You can look at any traditional diet around the world and find a healthy approach. The Harvard School of Public Health, I showed that um, healthy eating plate. Their website is called The Nutrition Source. That's a great place for all of your nutrition questions, really. They talk about the latest research, um, but they also have specifics about, you know, what's protein and how much should I eat? Uh, what's a carbohydrate? Um, they'll get more details about fat in there, in there as well. And then the intuitive eating website, this is the one from the two founders that I talked about. Um, there's guides there. It's not as robust as some of the others. They really would like people to, to, to read their book and, and they have a workbook as well. So those are, um, those are some great resources for you. And again, we'll send those out in the slides. So thank you all for attending and I really appreciate your attention. I will now um, shift over to a more question and answer. Um, I did want to mention that we also see individual clients at uh, Community Health Resource Center. So if you would like to talk more to myself or one of our dietitians, you are welcome to, uh, to join us. I'm gonna open up a Q&A and chat as well. Yeah, so I can introduce um, some of these questions. Um, so first, how can a person get enough calcium if dairy is to be limited? Yeah, that's a good question. So we, you know, we think about uh, the impact of, of specific nutrients on health. And in this example, we're talking about calcium, which is one of the central minerals in the diet. And it's really the, the connection with calcium and health. Most people think about bone health, but calcium has uh, lots of impacts on the body and, and it is uh, important to make sure you get enough. There are plant sources of calcium that you can get. It's a little bit harder because calcium is, is, is very rich in dairy products. You don't have to eat a lot of dairy to get quite a bit. For plant-based sources, you can start looking at things like leafy greens, um, but also beans. Uh, soy is in particular is particularly high. So some of the soy milks have quite a bit of calcium. Um, you also might see some uh, supplement. Uh, some foods are supplemented with calcium. Um, things like uh, orange juice or, or, or some of the uh, non-dairy milks. Um, you can take a supplement as well if you decide you're not going to eat calcium, but you really need to get a little bit more. So one person's asking for some cookbook titles that are healthy, but also tasty. It's a good question. And, you know, um, so many cookbooks out there and also online resources for, for cooking that mostly focus on taste, but some also do, of course, um, focus on health. So I would, I would refer you to some of those, those websites that I mentioned. Uh, in addition, you can look at the American Heart Association. They have lots of recipes and, and uh, even some cookbooks if you want it that way. Uh, I think, you know, if you, you take some of these concepts with you to understand, you know, what is healthy food? What does it look like? What am I looking for? Then you can flip through a cookbook and pretty quickly tell, you know, one of the giveaways is going to be, uh, does it follow the, the healthy plate concept that I was talking about? And, you know, being the, the dietitian that I am when I'm cooking, if the recipe doesn't do that, then I ignore them and I add more vegetables to my dish <laughs> so that it, it builds up uh, to uh, get to that point. Uh, so I'm not recommending any specific cookbooks maybe, but, um, but really using some of those organizations that you trust that have your, if it's heart health that you're looking for, then that's a, that's a good filter to, to find them. Another question is about um, plant-based saturated fats. Uh, so I mentioned this a little bit in the talk too. Um, so the question is, um, are they the same as animal-based saturated fats? Does the body know the difference? So once we, you know, I think a key concept in nutrition is that once you break apart the food into its constituent parts, it doesn't necessarily matter where that came from. So if the saturated fat is coming from um, beef or it's coming from coconut oil, the body's going to interpret them in a similar way. However, foods are not made up of just one thing. 
So you're getting other nutrients with the food as well, and that can have an impact. It's a little bit incorrect to say this one food is going to have this impact on your health. We really want to focus on the complete context of what you're eating throughout the, not just that meal, but throughout the day, throughout the week. That really helps us understand the impact of, of food on health. So for example, when I was talking about limiting the amount of red meat, you know, eating small amounts of red meat are not going to affect your health, especially if you eat it with lots of high fiber foods that have lots of anti-inflammatory, antioxidant compounds, then the impact on your cholesterol is going to be very different than if you just eat uh, a large steak or a large amount of coconut oil. This question also makes me think about one of the, we call them health halos, which means words where people interpret that to be healthy. So for a while, gluten-free, you know, being like, oh, if it's gluten-free, it must be healthy. Just maybe if you're <laughs> gluten intolerant, but really has nothing to do with the health impact of the food. But vegan can be another one. So if you see a vegan donut, chances are it's going to have lots of sugar in it because it's a donut. It's going to have lots of saturated fat in it from coconut or palm oil. That's how they do, that's how they make vegan baked goods. So if it's a donut, it's a donut in terms of health, enjoy it, but it's not health food. Okay, so let's see. Um, the next question, what are, um, studies about by ethnicity on heart disease or by age, socioeconomic status, status or geography. So, you know, the, I, w I didn't get into all of the risk factors associated with heart disease, but there are many and they can have to do with genetics and they can have to do with our um, access to healthcare, uh, our, the environment that we live in, in terms of pollutants and toxins, lots of different in age, of course, and gender too, potentially. So um, yes, there are studies on this and, and you can go to the American Heart Association, for example, and find you know, the different ways that um, these factors can influence your health. In general, the things that are in our control are not usually these, these factors. So the things that are in our control are how we move, how we eat, how we manage our stress, how we sleep. Some, sometimes the, the toxins that we're exposed to, but not always, you know, in this case, I might be thinking about mm, cigarettes or alcohol. So that's often a, you know, good to know those, those factors, but you know, what can I do about my health? That's where where lifestyle really comes into play. A uh, question about protein. Um, this person asking, how much should I get? I weigh 169 pounds. So, you know, we're, we're, we're really focused today on, on heart health and protein doesn't have a big impact on that. You can think about the quality of your protein. That really matters. The source of your protein think about a protein food being like uh, red meat can have an influence on your health, not so much because of the protein, but because of the fat that comes along with the protein. Often high protein foods, especially from animals, come along with fat as well. So, but you could also divide your weight by two and come up with your answer. That's another way. It's kind of a quick shortcut. If you're somebody who likes to to count grams and no numbers like that. Personally, I think it's a bit of a distraction because it's not a big factor in terms of your health. The one exception there, or maybe one exception there, and there might be others, is as people age, they do need a little bit more protein. We're a little less efficient about um, digesting and absorbing proteins and a little less efficient about getting them into the muscles when we get older. So we often see people losing muscle mass as they age in part because they don't use them as much, but also they might not be getting enough protein. So you might need to eat a little bit more. Okay. Question. I'm going to jump back over to the chat. Why I don't feel full when I'm eating, but later standing up and then I felt I ate too much and uncomfortable. Yeah. So thank you for the question. And it's really, this is really getting back to what I was talking about in terms of the, of the delay in our fullness. 
Another way to think about this is that we have very strong internal signals to eat. There's lots of, uh, and this is a survival mechanism. If you don't have enough calories, you don't survive. So, you know, in terms of evolution, we've evolved many mechanisms in the body to drive us to eat. This is why we like sweet taste. Sweet is a marker of calories in nature. Of course, we don't live in a natural food environment so much anymore. So the, the industrial food or uh, processed foods can um, trick our taste buds uh, and kind of override some of the, the, the natural signals that we have, which also contributes to this common issue of finding that uh, I feel okay during eating, but then I get overfull. It might have to do with obviously how much you're eating, but it also might have to do with the kind of food that you're eating as well. So if you're eating food that is very rich, has lots of, of fat in it, that's very calorie dense, lots of sugar potentially, that in a smaller volume will give you more calories and also is, is harder on the system to digest, it slows down digestion, and that can create um, a sense of, of, of fullness in the, in the stomach. We also have signals in the, or sensors, sorry, in the stomach for fat. So when, when that, as that rises and rises, the, the concentration of fat in the stomach, those signals can get triggered and that can be part of that fullness signal. So if this is something that you struggle with, I would encourage you to do that mindful eating exercise that I talked about, especially the one where you check in with your um, hunger and fullness signals as you're eating your meal, maybe halfway through, maybe three quarters of the way through and think about do I want to keep eating? Do I want to feel, how do I want to feel when I'm finished? Maybe not standing up and feeling like I ate too much. Maybe I want to be satisfied with my meal and not feel over full. Okay. Another question. This one's about, uh, oh, a diet for kidney, kidney, renal diet. So a renal diet is basically a diet that people follow when they have kidney disease. Um, and it's the most difficult diet to follow in many ways. So I would say that's a presentation right there. <laughs> that's a big, bigger topic. And actually the, the Community Health Resource Center does a, uh, a free um, kidney series on, on diet uh, every year. So um, I would encourage you to, to, to look into that. But also you can go to the National Kidney Foundation they have great um, guidelines and recommendations, especially for holidays. Um, the, this is a bigger topic than I can unfortunately answer today. Okay, I have one more question. Um, this one, uh, as a smaller, as a small person getting older, how can I get enough nutrients when I don't eat that much? Uh, I like small meals, but not the standard three per day. Yes, yeah, so I, I do work with a lot of people who have a similar issue, not getting enough. You know, today, much of what I was talking about was getting too much, you know, overeating or excess sugar, excess fat. But the opposite can be a problem too. Um, kind of like I mentioned, I guess, with the with the protein needs. So I would say that for 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 you, um, when you eat smaller portions in order to get enough nutrients, you do have to eat more often. So it doesn't mean you have to eat three meals a day, but you probably need to eat more than twice a day. Uh, you may need to have, you know, think about snacking, um, adding in uh, smaller meals for yourself, um, because it is going to be challenging to get enough nutrients in, in, you know, small portions, if you only eat twice a day. Another shortcut that sometimes works for people is thinking about not just eating my nutrients, but also drinking my nutrients. So you can look at things like juices or smoothies, um, shakes to, to help kind of boost up the, the nutrients in your diet. Um, you can also create more nutrient dense meals. Um, if you're losing weight and you need more calories, then you might increase the fat in your diet. If you're losing muscle mass and you need more protein, you might increase the high protein foods. So you can think about 
how often you're eating, but also what is it that you're eating at your meals and uh, what are you drinking? Um, I'll just read it out. Uh, eating slowly and chewing your food also prevents overeating. Being extra conscious of this, if eating alone is also helpful, do you agree? Absolutely. <laughs> that's a, that's a good a good one. You know, the pace of eating can matter in terms of being able to um, pay attention to how you're eating and not overeat. So yeah, uh, thank you again, everyone. I really appreciate the questions and, and having you here with me. I hope you learned some things and I look forward to potentially hearing from you and I'll turn it back to Lily. Yeah, once again, and I just wanted to thank everyone for joining the Canbar Cardiac Care Center for this wonderful presentation on intuitive eating and heart health during the holidays, which, as we learned in this presentation, can be a really challenging time to navigate. And thank you to you, Jason, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be here with us to present on such an important topic. Um, Canbar Cardiac Care Center will be hosting bi-monthly community education events relating to cardiac care. So keep an eye out for an email with more information about our upcoming presentations and thank you all again have a great evening and happy holidays yeah happy holidays